I'm Daniel John, otherwise known as DJ Short. Waiting to meet you. Well, I didn't get high the first time I smoked pot. It took six tries. And on that sixth try, the first thing that came to my mind was the dentist's office. My mother worked for a dentist. He was writing a paper on anesthetizing children. So I would get nitrous oxide regularly on uh, two times a year, even if he was just cleaning my teeth. The second thing that crossed my mind, and I was livid now having experienced this herb, was that they lied to me. Once I had discovered cannabis, it was like the missing ingredient in my life. I was lucky the, the time that I entered the fray, again, it was 1971. There was a lot of high-grade uh, tropical sativa commercially available. Brotherhood of Eternal Love were bringing in larger and larger loads, the Thai stick, um, the Highland Oaxaca, and the Acapulco Gold. Uh, those various things which cost a little bit more, that was a small percentage of the loads that were coming in. The bulk and majority of that tropical sativa were in 80 to 100 ton, what we call mafia loads, came in in very large boats. And that stuff was, you know, C-grade if you were lucky. And that's pretty, come mid-70s, that pretty much was the market, the good stuff would present itself. And we learned, um, you know, when we would find something of decent quality, save our pennies, pool our pennies, let's buy a quantity of this, because it's only going to be around for a couple months. So, you know, we, we learned how to, you know, uh, jump on the quality bandwagon when it was in town. The big mafia loads, we suspect that they treated it somehow. I mean, I knew there were seeds in there. I tried sprouting, we put them in the dirt. Rumor was it was irradiated, it may have been steamed, pressurized, heated some way, but the seeds didn't sprout. They just did not sprout from the big commercial loads. And it wasn't until a series of events took place. I got some Hawaiian that uh, was seeded and there was a breakfast cereal, I think it was honeycomb, I'm not sure, but they gave away in the box this little seed sprout kit. And it was a little plastic bubble with a, with a sponge in the bottom of it. And I, I, I didn't even want the cereal. I bought the box just to get the silly little thing, brought it home. I took one of those whole Hawaiian buds and put it in there wet. And in a couple days, there were the, the tails coming out, and I was just ecstatic. Back in those days, there weren't grow shops. There weren't, you couldn't go and buy pots. You couldn't buy soil. I was buying little metal waste paper baskets, about yay big, using a can opener along the bottom of them for uh, drainage. I'd get some gravel out of the driveway in the bottom and just get dirt out of the backyard. And then this was all under a four-foot fluorescent light at the foot of my bed. Didn't know about bud cycles, didn't know about it. It just grew the plants. They were beautiful to look at. It was, you know, very rewarding in, in that capacity, but it really didn't get you that high either. But it was satisfying to do. I have a degree from the U of O in, in psychology, and it was uh, my drug experiences that fueled my curiosity. It wasn't until I moved to Eugene in 1978 that I really uh, got serious in terms of growing and breeding, um, doing all those things, uh, and that was all sativa. All of my contemporaries ran with the sativa pollen on the indica female. And I grew those out, ran with them a little bit, and was nowhere near as interested, and I'm the only person I know of that went the other way that took the indica pollen to the sativa female. I think part of the reason was, was that I had seeds of the indica, and those came to me in a roundabout way from a manicurist who was working with a group who I had supplied genetics to in the past, so they knew who I was. They had just this first season of this indica. They were doing some R&D work with it, so part of the job that the manicurist had was to see to it that no seeded buds went to market. And, you know, what do we do with these seeded buds? He got permission to give those to me, and that's how I ended up with the indica uh, genes. They were one generation removed, but they were crossed with themselves from Afghanistan. They were a very pure um, indica Afghan uh, variety. So while I'm growing out 
um, these other seeds in these subsequent years after uh, 78, 79, I'm seeing uh, the hybrids present themselves. Now, when you have two very dissimilar parents, and that's your P1 generation, and that was for me, I had these very pure indicas and these very pure sativas. And I didn't learn about this until way after the fact. So this was about, I don't know, two decades ago now, maybe I learned about this phenomenon in botany or in biology called transgressive segregation. And what that refers to, I use the example uh, dog breeding. And if you could cross a Great Dane with a Chihuahua, um, and those are your P1s, you'll end up with a F1 generation that's very uniform and something in between those two. And that's what I witnessed in my F1 generation. Um, they looked a lot like Lebanese plants, uh, medium height, long spear shaped buds with a full cacophony of flavor. Uh, I, I've used terms like uh, ethnic holiday is a term I came up with, which is every smell. You know, I grew up in Detroit, uh, Polish, Romanian. Uh, so I had a lot of experience with ethnic holidays where you, you go to grandma's house or whatever and you have the food cooking and the Christmas tree and the cologne and the cigarettes and the alcohol all just mixed. So these F1s had this great cacophony of odor. It's just like spilling a can of paint in a hairspray factory where they make burgundy and, and uh, dry fruits. And they, yeah, they were all uniform. And you can take any two of the F1s, any two, a male and a female, you cross them of the F1s, you make your F2s. It was in my F2 generation. For me, this would have been mid-late 79. And you start to see these uh, transgressive segregation things that are beyond what those uh, indica and sativa were. The strain blueberry presented itself while I was just doing my work. I had a, a berry variety, and berry was, well, oh, this is very nice. It's kind of grapeish. Um, there were citruses, there were woods, there were florals, but I just ran with the berry. So I take a berry mother and a berry father in that F2 generation, and I cross it. I grow those seeds out. That's the F3 generation. If I'm successful, I will encounter that berry expression in at least 50% of the progeny. And I always be conservative in my estimation, so I say 25 to 50 percent of that F3 generation. Then it will be um, 50 to 75 percent of the F4 generation. And it's the same thing again. And in the F3s, I'll pick a berry-leaning male, a berry-leaning fe uh, female, see if I can get up to that 50 to 75 percent um, ratio, which I did, and that's where the blueberry came from. Now, back in the day, it wasn't called Blueberry. That name didn't come until mid-90s. Um, it was used on and off, you know, but the main term for it that developed was the kind. The bl original Blueberry, uh, 1980, was referred to by my customers as the kind because I would, you know, doing this R&D work, so I have 15 different types of varieties. I'm selling them all, and then people are coming back, no, no, I want this, I want the kind, I want the kind. I mean, this is how it worked with the tropics, too. That's how we got the brotherhood to get the quality up. Um, it's the consumer barking up the ladder saying, no, we don't want this, we want this. We'll pay for this. <laughs> I mean, tie sticks were selling for 270 an ounce at a time when pot was $40 an ounce. And yet myself and many, many people gladly paid the 270 an ounce uh, for the tie just because of the experience that it rendered. So that's kind of where the blueberry came from, and it just had this overall desirable characteristic to it. It was a lot like the Oaxacan, but not entirely. I was in a very advantageous uh, situation, just the timing uh, that I had with this. First of all, the Indica genetics showed up late 78, which was the same year, it was late 78, that HID lighting, high-intensity discharge lighting, became commercially available. This happened in 78. I was <laughs> in Eugene growing in 78. Everything was coming to Eugene, too mainly for the cheap electricity when all the Northern Californias were going indoors, when it got too heaty outdoors. Uh, electricity was 17 cents a kilowatt hour in Humboldt County. It was 2.14 cents in Eugene. 
I think it was cheaper at night um, as well, uh, coupled with a very lucrative buyer's real estate market of the time, just sort of set the stage. Uh, now, up to that point, up to the Indica and the uh, HID lighting, I'd been working with Sativa, uh, 16, 18-week Sativa that I'm growing under fluorescent systems. Um, that I built myself. The canopy was about three, four inches thick <laughs> through the whole thing, um, but it was growing good pod. Well, here comes the HID lights, here comes the indica. The indica made quite a splash when it showed up because here's this thing, takes eight weeks to finish, smells like a dead skunk under the house, completely unique to the, to the times, um, and had this you know, couch lock, just sedate effect that was novel for me for about a month. And I got, whoop, been there, done that. I'm, I'm sick of this. There was a High Times uh, issue that came out in 1983. Um, black background, a big trimmed indica bud with a red slash symbol over it, and it said, ban the bud. And it was an article by a uh, writer named R at the time, I'm pretty sure it's Robert Connell Clark, um, about this wretched phenomenon of our indica hybrids were polluting the uh, gene pool in the tropics. Um, you we're still seeing it to this day. You see pictures on Jamaica, uh, these plants growing on the hillsides and they're only about yay tall. That's that indica hybrid. 30 years ago, those plants could be 18 feet tall. We can get back there again. It's just going to take some time. I guess I should point out, too, you hear, you know, indica sativa, and, and what is the difference? The only difference between indica and sativa is flowering time. To some extent, the cannabinoid ratio, the terpenes that are in it, its, its signature, uh, yes, will be different. Sativas tend to be more sticky, uh, because their oils aren't all trapped in the trichome, um, in the glandular stalk trichome with a membrane. On sativa, there are a lot of hairs on the surface of the leaf that put the oil directly onto the surface of the leaf, which is why in the tropics, the main form of, of hash production is a hand rubbing. And outside of the tropics, it's some form of sieving. And I, I'm speculating that the glandular stalk trichome, uh, that whole mechanism was bred strictly for hash production outside of the tropics. The only exception to this rule uh, was Nepal, uh, simply because Nepal technically is not in the tropics. It's just outside of the tropics, but it has this very high elevation. So we're thinking it has something to do with high uh, UV ultraviolet radiation is what's bringing out these phenotypes in these plants. And if you think about the tropics, the, the, the thing about the tropics, it's a unique place on Earth because it's the only place on Earth where you get direct overhead sunlight uh, twice a year, but it's directly overhead, meaning that the atmosphere is filtering um, the least amount of, of UV. When the sun is on an angle through the atmosphere, it's, it's being filtered by much more atmosphere. When it's directly above, you're getting much more of that high um, ultraviolet radiation. So there's uh, speculation as to, you know, the, the tropics being uh, what they are. That's one of the reasons. Now, the flowering time thing, um, in the tropics, the veg cycle is 13 hours of daylight, 11 hours of dark. The bud cycle is the exact opposite of that, 11 hours of daylight, 13 hours of dark, which is one of the things I recommend to people who are growing indoors is to switch your bud cycle. Most people are accustomed to a 12-12, 12 on, 12 off with the lights, and I recommend to people to do 11 on and 13 off for the simple reason you will see phenotypic expressions from your plants that you do not see um, otherwise on a 12-12 on a light cycle. Potency, again, is an odd one. These, these great strains of yore that I'm trying to replicate tested at 7% THC. They tested things differently back then where they did grind up the whole load and just take a sample out of the whole plant 
instead of being very selective out of what parts they're testing. The most potent things back in the day was Maui Waui, and that was 10%. So there's something else going on. There's something besides the THC, which we know about. People have talked about the entourage effect that we're learning now, which is the uh, play between all the various cannabinoids in that ratio and the terpenes as well. The, the flavonoids and the terpenes have quite a profound effect. I was doing my work kind of oblivious to the whole uh, botany aspect of it, the scientific aspect. I consider myself much more of an artist than a scientist. I respect and appreciate science, but it is not the be-all, end-all. We're talking about subtleties here that science, science can't grok magic yet. See, it's not ready. And instead of accepting that something like magic exists, science has to say, no, it doesn't. Great book on the subject uh, by a philosopher named Thomas Kuhn, K-U-H-N, called Structures of Scientific Revolution. It's based on this. How does science then, how do the uh, parameters of science expand themselves to encompass what we know to be true, but we can't prove yet with science? So, Again, with all drugs teaching us about neural pharmacology, and now we're to the cannabinoid system, which is so finely tuned uh, through our system, um, I, I have a hard time trusting either science or the medical establishment, the AMA in particular. I don't need science when the person's telling me they feel better. So. As we study this, it gets more and more complex. Levels of complexity that science, I don't feel, is equipped to handle at this point in time. We learn about the entourage effect, these, these varying uh, cannabinoid ratios. Well, I sat down with some contemporaries not long ago, and we came to the conclusion that, in essence, okay, you know how when you test cannabis and you see this graph and there's these spikes. I don't know if I'm in the, but you have a big spike for THC and then a bunch of minor spikes and then a big spike, say, for CBD and then minor spikes. Well, what we're going to find out is that it is a ratio between two of the minor spikes, a very specific ratio between these minor spikes and not just in one range, it's going to be in several ranges. Whether or not we're going to ever identify what those two little tiny spikes are remains to be seen. Personally, I don't care whether or not we ever identify those. The fact that they work is all that matters. Galileo with the telescope, they thought they had it down. They said, damn it, you know, the sun goes around the earth. Well, here's this little thing that shows you something else. So we need to start exploring that. There's no other way around it. You've got to walk that terra to map it. If you're familiar with chaos theory, it's in this incidental testing. It's in the subject, subjective testing of the general population. Realistically, it's the cancer patients. It's the MS people. They don't have to know. It's the ratio between the two things. They know it works. I am an artist, a musician. I'm making a song. What science figures out about that song later on is science's business. I just want to make the song. In the divine order of things, you know, science is a tool to create art, not, you know, as, as this, this great thing that art is to bow down to. For me, it's genetic, all right? My great-grandmother, she was a gypsy herbalist in the city of Detroit. She got busted in the city of Detroit growing pot in 1938. So I, I grew up with this. I love the medicinal aspect of it, but I, you know, in all honesty, I appreciate the inebriant side of it as well. You know, money plays a hand in this as well. It's, it's a factor in the equation, and there's that lucrative aspect of, of money. If you take an indoor grow room and break it down square foot, and how do you make the most money? It starts out with bud, uh, clones, I think, is after that, and then seeds just in terms of the price they fetch, are the most lucrative um, part of the industry. People just don't understand the seed business. And like, yeah, you can garnish a lot of attention per quick, and it can go away just as quick. And so there are so many 
new people on the block. Um, one person right now that has a lot of attention is a character called named Bodai. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I just met him last year, two years ago. And again, he's ran with everybody else's work. Subcool did the same thing. Take the elites, cross them, redo them, either rebrand it or brand it as exactly what it was. There's there's a uh, little respect in this industry in that capacity. Um, so there's a lot more uh, breeders right now. There are very few that I respect. I like Ben Dronkers just because of what he did for his money, his, with his money. You know, he, he the, the Hash Museum, he, he uh, funded a lot of activism. Um, but the product just doesn't, it's not, it's not anything I'd ever be interested in working with. Same with Greenhouse Seeds and the big major players, uh, Dutch Passion, who I'm going to guesstimate has made probably about $10 million off of my blueberry that I got paid under 100000 for. And they just hold the reins. He says, well, well, well I just, nothing lasts forever. It's only business. I don't feel I should have to pay you anymore. I tried getting lawyers. It wasn't time yet. I didn't care. What I did get from him was uh, the fact that, from the Hank and Dutch Passion, anyhow, that's my intellectual property, those names, and that I have in writing the rights to the European market using those names. I talked to lawyers about doing something about that. And the only reason I want to do something about it with Dutch Passion is the bulk of majority of the complaints that I field about blueberry, I could, well, where'd it come from? Where I come to find out, it's Dutch Passion Blueberry. So it's quality concerns. The key word I keep telling people in this industry right now, if you want to really get ahead in this industry, remember this one word, circumvent. Circumvent. Anybody that's trying to do things straightforward, head-on, legitimately, is going to run into so much resistance, they're going to hit a backwater that they're going to get stuck in. Let them go first. Watch what happens. Go around it. Um, it's, it's really that simple. Um, and I don't know what people are thinking. Again, it's this whole money concept. And it'd be wonderful if we could use the cannabis industry to show the world how to do capitalism right. Oh, I would be so behind that. And that means that no one's going to make a billion dollars off this plant. No one person. And uh, I'm going to do whatever I can in my power to see to it that that's the route it goes. And this whole thing with the Cannabis Genome Project um, and this open uh, cannabis project where everything being tested genetically will then be deemed public domain. And I, was, I didn't know what to think of that at first. Um, Mowgli, Mowgli Holmes kind of dropped that on me at the last hemp fest, and he's slowly been relating to it, but I think he was nervous about what my reaction was going to be because he's coming back to me telling me that 85% of the hybrids they're testing have the genetic marker of mine in it. So I've got a position in, in this playing field, um, and when I thought it through, I realized, no, that is the solution to my biggest concern. My biggest concern right now is that I'm going to move forward. Things are legal. I'm going to just happily be doing my things with my products. I use nothing else, nobody else's genetics. This is all land race that I came up with, that I'm going to get a cease and desist letter from some Monsanto-esque corporation in the future telling me I can't work with my own stuff. And I sat there, how, how do you beat this? How do you protect yourself from this? And you can either play the whole game get the lawyers, file the trademarks and the patents and the whatever, which costs a hell of a lot of money, or you can just let it all go. And for me, letting it all go is it's just a no-brainer because then I don't have to worry about that um, cease and desist letter, and I don't have to worry about my uniqueness in this uh, industry. That's going to be there no matter what I've got. I got things to keep me busy for the rest of my life. I'll never sprout anybody else's seeds. I won't be able to sprout all of mine. I don't have time. Um, and I've only released about 30, maybe 40% of my genetic library. I was careful about that. Because I have all these, these hazes, these sativas that had no 
real commercial potential until now. Every flavor of haze. I have every flavor of haze. Um, but that takes time and space, um, R&D, to get those things up and uh, discover what those are. So I do have things that I could play that game with down the road if I want to. But I'd rather just let it all go and just let everybody have it. One of the things I'm going to be doing relatively soon here is an R&D project where I want to develop some strains strictly for resin production, not for flower production at all, just for resin production. They're not going to look anything like the plants we're accustomed to. You see these fields in California, the Christmas tree, 99 of them on a, on a ranch, whatever. When I do my field for resin, it's going to look like a field of alfalfa. It's just a green field and it will be multi-harvested through the year. It will begin producing resin, I would assume, late July. And what I anticipate doing is taking the top 18 inches about every three weeks from late July on and just processing it immediately. So no harvesting per se, no uh, curing, no manicuring, very light labor intensity. Uh, when you're growing for resin. And one acre, 42,000 square feet, can produce 1 million grams of resonated flower material, which um, will be anywhere for about 200,000, roughly 200,000 grams of concentrate per acre. We, we should be doing this outdoors. I'll say this much. Uh, another thing, uh, if you are interested in the cannabis industry, w the two things... Right now, right now in the cannabis industry, the guaranteed in, if you can fulfill any one of these, number one is a formulator. And a formulator is the chemist who takes the crude extraction and makes it into that very fine, nice flavored, colorful oil that has the full effect. Um, I know several formulators. Half of them are academic and half of them are just from the industry who've been at this for... 30 years or more, it's almost a, a guarantee. I know of people being offered millions of dollars uh, just to sign on with a company that, yes, they will process their product when the time comes. These CO2 machines that they're selling that are over $100,000 for a five-liter machine, they'll send you a technician to show you how to do what's called the crude extraction. The crude extraction has all the lipids, all the oils, all the waxes still in there. It's a marketable product, but it's not finely refined like what the formulators do. And up to this point in time, that's been kind of secret knowledge that people don't share that much, which is why when someone like Grey Wolf comes along and just blows the lid off of that, um, I, I think that's very beneficial because now there are people taking his knowledge and expanding on that. I respect who he is and what he's done, which in essence is the sharing of knowledge and information. He's a very knowledgeable person who figured out these extraction methods, which a lot of people are holding very close to the vest right now. When the second one was someone who can produce like 600 pounds a week. There's nobody doing that yet. In terms of what I've released and what's to come, the best is yet to come. Every flavor of haze. Who is that going to come into nice vape oils? I love the cannabis plant. She's my angel. She's, you know, my, my ally. <laughs>